Rock Church, how you guys doing today? Good? Man, it's good to see you. Packed house. Love to see that. And uh, if you're with us maybe for the first time or maybe new around here, my name is Josh and uh, I'm one of the pastors and just so thankful that you are here with us. Um, it's weird for me, I'll just be honest, as, as, um, as your pastor that I'm used to knowing where people sit. And, and that's one of the hardest things about our new building three weeks in. I'm like, oh, they're sitting here. And you know what I mean? And, and like, I like to be able to look at people and see your faces and all that. So, so I'm, you know, trying to figure this out and everybody's moving around and all that, but we'll get it eventually. I'll kind of figure it out. But I typically know my high school students are always right here, which is great. And I like y'all and even middle school. I was, I was talking right here to y'all. Did you not know that? Are you not paying attention? Now you're right on, now you're on the spot. My fault. I shouldn't do that. Don't worry, Ariana. Nobody knows it was you I was talking to. You're welcome. Y'all good? Good, good. Like I said, it takes me a second to get going. Um, who's been watching the Olympics this week? Anybody? Yeah, it, man, it's been fun watching it and just inspiring and hearing stories and, and things like that. And my family, um, we're, we're kind of a sports junkie type family. We're always watching sports. Um, but the Olympics causes me to watch sports that I typically never watch. You know what I mean? Like, nothing's wrong with gymnastics. I just don't watch gymnastics, right? You know what I mean? But at the Olympics... I watch gymnastics, you know what I mean? It seems like that's what's on TV, so that's what we're watching. And there's been some inspiring stories. I remember I was watching when this one happened live, uh, a gymnast from Great Britain decided to do a front flip and went a little too far. Anybody remember this? Yeah, some of you saw that maybe happen. And that was, um, that's painful, you know what I mean? And uh, I, I remember watching it and she got up from that and then she um, went over to the side and she's getting ready to continue to perform and she just like, I'm done. You know what I mean? Like tapped out, like something, something's fuzzy in my head. And, and, you know, she walked off and went back to the locker room and I don't know if they went through the NFL, you know, uh, concussion protocol or whatever happened. 15 minutes later, she comes back out. And it was inspiring for this reason. And I don't understand all the rules, but if she wouldn't have come back out and performed in the next thing that she was supposed to perform in, then it would have hurt her team's chances of moving on to the all around and doing things like that. So she basically said, I had to do it for my team. Uh, so very inspiring. Uh, there was another um, sport that I ended up starting to watch with my family that, again, I never watch because it's synchronized. And and bottom line is, I don't watch synchronized things. You know what I mean? Like synchronized swimming, synchronized diving. That's typically not me. But I got caught up watching this group do their dives. And, you know, this is the U.S. team. And, of course, they're a great team because one of them's from Indiana. And great things come out of Indiana. Thank you for the one person that said amen over here. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. Another huger at heart. So anyway, you know what I mean? Like, like I got into their story, and, and it was cool just following along. And I mean, it's weird. I'll be honest. Like, those divers, they don't wear much. Like, one of my friends, his daughter was watching with, with him, and she's a little girl. And she's like, Daddy, why are those boys wearing panties? You know what I mean? Because those Speedos, I mean, they're like, well, anyway, um, but I caught myself just like, because of their total synchronization and the way they were diving and, and it was like, this is amazing. But then their story of those two was inspiring. If you ended up watching, you know, they won a medal and then, you know, they're being interviewed afterwards and one of them is his very first Olympics and they're like, were you nervous? And he's like, no, my identity is fully rooted in Christ. And I'm out here performing and having fun doing my sport, but what happens is not going to ruin me as a person. And it was like, cool. It was a, just a great, inspiring, watching him give his testimony to the world at that point. Um, so, so very cool. Um, so the Olympics, you know, you watch Michael Phelps, you watch these other swimmers and, and people, it's been pretty inspiring. Now, Let's admit it, though, we live in the South, and this time of year, there's another type of sport that inspires most of us, and it is? 
football, right? Yeah, and people are like, it's here, it's here, which is great, and I love football. I've been watching preseason reruns last night, you know? But I'm like, oh, it's football, you know, so I'll watch it, you know? And, and, and I love football, and I know here there's a big debate over these two teams because some of you are inspired by the orange, right? And some of you are inspired by Garnet, and... and, and Really surprised, that, that was a little outnumbered there. You know what I mean? And some of you are inspired by Teal, I agree. That's our local team, which I love them. But I, I struggled with this, and you all know I've been here now. You know, this is to be like my second, you know, football season. And, and I tried all last year, am I more Gamecocks? Am I more Clemson? And I just want to pull the pastor card and say, well, my job is to love everyone. And somebody looked at me and said, no, Jesus called that lukewarm and he'll spit you out of his mouth. Um, but, you know, it, it is a struggle because we have, you know, kids from The Rock that go to Carolina. We have kids from The Rock that, that go to Clemson. We have, you know, kids that, that, you know, are associated with both teams. So it's difficult. So I want to make it as easy as I can for our whole church and show you the easy way to figure out the best team if you truly want to be inspired. And it's this one that I'm going to show you. Okay, so I'll just solve the argument for all of you. I'm getting this, yes. Um, no, but I, I do bring up football for this reason. One, it's, it's, it, the season is hitting, and there's always inspiring stories, but there's one specifically I wanted to talk about this morning. Happened many years ago um, in a college football game. Marshall University. It was the first time I'd really kind of paid attention to Marshall, and it was this guy, Byron Lefwich. Now, Byron, a long time ago, he played for them. He's had an NFL career, all that. But if you, um, if you remember this story, and if you don't, I'll tell it to you. What was happening is at the end of the game, uh, Byron Lefwich, who was their quarterback, got hurt. Now, he stayed in the game. He, was, he kept playing, um, and they were coming down towards the end. Time's running out. They're trying to score. They're trying to win. He throws a long pass, gets completed. The guy makes a good yards after the catch and eventually gets tackled, but now they're running out of time. Well, Leftwich is hurt. He can't run the length of the field, so two of his linemen pick him up and carry him, I don't remember if it's 40, 50 yards, to the new line of scrimmage just so he could take a snap. And they went on for a victory, and it happened because two men said, we will carry you so that we can go on to victory. And that story is very similar to a story that I want us to teach from this morning that's found in the Bible. It's a story about some men who picked a guy up and said, let me carry you to Jesus because he can bring victory in your life. And I want to use this story this morning to finish up our core values that we have as a church. You know, since we've opened three weeks ago, we've been kind of going through our core values. Week one, uh, we talked about our, our, you know, one core value, and that was first things first, which really means put God first and his mission in your life. And we talked about that by using our mission statement of love God, love people, do something about it. And then last week, we went on to a couple other core values. We talked about come as you are, that Jesus doesn't say, hey, try to get everything in your life right, then come to me. But Jesus says, no, come. And then when you start hanging out with Jesus, when you start becoming more like Jesus, then you can expect some change to come into your life. So we talked about come as you are, but expect change. Today, I wanna just kind of finish up our core values. And, and we're just gonna kind of hit them on them a, a little bit by using this story we're going to look at things like team up. Um, team up is a core value. If you see any of our volunteers, it's on the back of their shirts because it's this concept that I'm going to team up with other people for my own spiritual development, but also for the betterment of others because we can do more when we work together. Okay, so we'll talk about teaming up. We'll talk about a core value of it's not about me, of making sure that we understand it's about Jesus and about helping others connect with him. We'll talk about this generation. Uh, when we say the word this generation, we're talking about young adults, uh, college students, high schoolers, middle schoolers, uh, elementary kids. We're talking about these, this group of, of kids up to young adults, and we really believe that they are a generation that can change the world. So we want to invest in them. And so we're going to use those things to kind of pull out from the story. So if you have your Bible, go to Mark chapter 2. 
Um, yeah, Mark is one of the gospel accounts. Uh, when we say gospel, we're talking about the first four books of the New Testament. And these are books that are basically biographies of Jesus. And Mark was a guy who, who wrote about Jesus and, and wrote about a story that, Jesus, uh, that happened in Jesus' life. So it's Mark chapter two. And I'm just gonna read it to you at first and then we'll kind of pick it apart. If, um, if you don't have a Bible, it'll be on the screen. But if you got a, uh, an iPad, an iPhone, anything like that, you can pull up the app and, and read it from there. There as well. Here's what it says, Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Uh, soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. And then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to a paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or stand up, pick up your mat and walk? So I, pr so I will prove to you that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And the man jumped up grabbed his mat and walked through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. Very cool story with a lot of different things we can pull from it. The, the way it begins is, you know, Jesus comes back to town and he's hanging out in a home. And as he's hanging out in this house, tons of people start to gather around. They're, they're filling the inside of the house so full that, that there's no more room. And then people start gathering around on the outside of the building and basically overcrowding the, the whole place because people wanted to connect with Jesus. Guys, I'll tell you right now, that's one of the most amazing things that you can ever see is people wanting to connect with Jesus. You see, I get a bird's eye view. I get to sit back and I get to see our church like this and see people are saying, man, I wanna come and connect with Jesus. Uh, one of the places I see this happen a lot is when I go overseas. And I might go overseas and I might be talking uh, or preaching at a small little village church. I I've seen it happen when I've been in Haiti, in Ecuador, and all these little foreign countries. I'll go and we'll go into a church that's probably no bigger than the size of this stage. And, and they'll pack it out. All of a sudden, you start talking about God and everybody from the village just shows up. And when they show up, they pack out that place. And then it never fails. As, as I'd be teaching, I look out and through the windows, you'd see these little eyeballs, little kids, like just wanting to hear more, wanting. You'd look into where the, the wood had been put on the side of the church where there's little holes in the wood. You'd see eyeballs kind of sticking through people saying, I want to connect with God. And as, as cool as that is overseas, I think sometimes we think, well, that's only over there. I think, no, I really believe people have a natural longing. They want to connect with God. They desire that. God has woven it on our hearts, he says in the book of Ecclesiastes, says that he has put an eternity on the hearts of men. So I really believe that all people, they long to connect with God. The problem is, as many people have become disinterested in church. They've become disconnected with Christians because they're like, man, church, Christians, not my type of people, not my type of place. They judge me. They speak bad about me. They, you know, they'll come up with all kinds of excuses, but in their hearts, they long still to connect with God. And that's the reason we see in what I would call this generation in the young adult crowd and down, we see a lot of times that age group has a deep desire for the spiritual but not necessarily for Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Like, they'll be like, yeah, I'm longing to connect with some type of higher being. I, I want to connect somehow with some kind of spiritual entity, but the idea of connecting with Jesus or the idea of connecting to church, like, ah, that was for my mom and dad, but I don't know if that's for me. And that's the reason we've got to do everything we can to help take people 
to Jesus. Which is, amen, yeah? Which is why then we also have to say, therefore, it's not about me. Because as a church, if we say, I want to take people to Jesus, or I especially want to take the younger generation to Jesus, then we have to be willing to say, it's not about me. If you look at this story, it's kind of a hidden part of this story. It says that the crowds were gathered around listening to Jesus, and then four men showed up with a guy on a mat. I often wonder, how did these four get men find this guy? It could have been their best friend. Very easily could have been. Could have been a guy they hang out with that they take care of all the time, and they're like, hey, we can get this guy healed so that he can walk on his own. Or it could have been some guys that were heading to meet Jesus, and they saw a man on the side of the road saying, this guy really needs Jesus. Oh, we don't know. What I do know is there's a crowd of people listening to Jesus that's disconnected from this one guy. Does that make sense? And I wonder, again, this is just wonder, did some people walk by a person in need because they were only concerned about themselves getting to Christ? They were only concerned about, well, I gotta, I gotta meet my needs. I heard this Jesus guy is there, so I gotta take care of me. And that's the reason one of our huge core values as a church is we say, it's not about me. That, yeah, we want to connect with Jesus, but the best thing we can do is help others to do that. And to do that, I've got to be willing to say, it's not about me. You know, I, I mentioned last week that I spent some time while we were building the church, walking around with a Sharpie and praying and writing our core values and writing prayers in places that were under the carpet, stuff like that. Well, one of those places I wrote was right here. And right across the, the metal stud that's right underneath my feet in huge capital letters, it says, it's not about you. And meaning I was saying that to me because I knew that there'd be many weekends I'd be standing right here and I would have the opportunity to communicate with, with you all as a church. And guys, I want you to know, I absolutely love doing this. Like, like, I love preaching. I love being a pastor. I love, but it would be real easy for me to walk out and go, ah, oh, this is my time in front of a bunch of people. What do I want to say? And I have to constantly remind myself, Josh, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about the communication of the gospel. It's about people connecting with Jesus. And that's the reason as a church, we have to say, it's not about me. It's not about whether or not they sing the song that I wanted them to sing. It's not about, you know, uh, did they set up the kids' ministry the way I wanted them to. It's not about, you know, did they put the coffee in the right place or have they given, given me this or did they put me in my right parking spot or even is the chair that I'm used to sitting in available because it's not about me. This church is about one man and that man's name is Jesus. That's it. That's it. That's what The Rock is about. We are about Christ. And when we say we're about Christ, we're about Christ and helping others get to him, especially the younger generation, which means we all have to be willing to say, it's not about me. Maybe that music is not my style of music, but if our younger people love it, sing it. You know what I'm saying? Because we're saying we want people to get to Jesus. Now, the best way for us to do that is by teaming up. Think about this story again. This guy, he's paralyzed. He's laying on a mat. If one guy would have came along and said, dude, I got to get you to Jesus, he could have fired him and carried him. But once he got to the house, it would have been pretty tough. But four guys working together were able to pick up his mat and carry him to Jesus. When we team up, we can do more and see God do immeasurably more. We saw that this week. Had a little incident at the church on Tuesday. I was in Charleston at my uh, son's football game, and I'm sitting there enjoying the game, and next thing I know, I get a call from a guy who was here. His name was Jim. He was working on the baptistry for us, cleaning it out. And uh, as he was here, he's like, hey, Josh, we got a problem. I'm like, all right, Jim, what's up? He goes, I'm draining the baptistry, and it, it, we must have a leak because there's some water on the ground. I was like, well, well, that's not good. He goes, well, I got that little part cleaned up, but let me walk around church, make sure it hasn't spread anywhere. And then they end up walking around the building, they get back to the castle, and they realize it's not the baptistry leaking, it's a supply line to a sink that has come off 
and water is shooting everywhere. And he's calling me. He's like, the place is flooded. I don't know if it's under the stage, but it's all over the castle. Josh, we need an army. We, we need some help. We got to do something. I'm like, Jim, I'm two and a half hours away. I'm like, let me just throw something out on social media and see what happens. No jokes. I'm sitting in the stands. I record this little bitty 40 second video on my phone, send it out there. Within 30 minutes, 30 guys, 12 shot backs, it's cleaned up. I mean, 30 minutes. Yeah. Like I'm getting, I'm getting texts 30 minutes later from these guys in call saying, Hey, it's all covered. Don't worry about it. I'm like, really? Cause good. Cause I'm, I want to enjoy a football game. But right now I'm just thinking, Oh no. <laughs> And he's like, no, seriously, an army showed up. Guys working together, getting it accomplished, and it was, it was cleaned up, it was done. Together we can do more and see God do immeasurably more. I've seen this happen with small groups who are doing a chicken bog for, for one of their buddies, and it seemed like the chicken bog never ran out. They're like, it shouldn't be that much, but we had enough to feed everybody because together you can do more and God can do immeasurably more. I've seen adoptions happen because the church came together, small groups came together and said, hey, we want to work together. And when we work together, God will do immeasurably more than we ever dreamed of. When we work together, we can do more and God will do immeasurably more than we would have ever even dreamed possible. One of my favorite pictures of our opening weekend is a picture of a guy who is getting baptized. Many of y'all know this guy. Many of y'all are in that picture who are in the room right now. This picture to me is a symbolism in so many levels. One, obviously you see the team up, all right, which is just broadcasting, we are a team. And what I love about this picture is this is a bunch of men who all serve in our Catalyst Middle School team together and in our Kids Rock area. Let me say that again, men serving our kids. That's beautiful. And the more men that we have serving young men, the better chances those young men are going to have of growing up being kingdom-minded individuals. So I love this picture for that. The other reason I love this picture is, is this is a group of guys that are teamed up. This is a group of guys, they do ministry together every week. This is a group of guys that went off to camp together. While they're at camp, Ashley, the guy who's getting baptized, loves Jesus, loved Jesus for a long time. But he just thought, man... When I, gave my, uh, when I was baptized, I, I kind of did it for the wrong reasons. I wasn't really ready. I, mean, I, I need to do this as my own. And you see him doing it as an adult believer with a bunch of men around him saying, do we want to take this step with you? And then some ladies, and then there's people up in the steps you can't even see. We bought a big baptistry for this reason, because we want to see teams. We want to see parents being able to baptize their teenagers. We want to see small groups getting together and, and doing things like this. When this group gets together, they do more, and then God does immeasurably more. So let me just be practical with you for just a second. Get on a team. Don't, don't just allow the rock just to be a place that you attend. And let me challenge you, get on a team, because you will see God move in amazing ways in your life. Now let me lay out three teams for you real quick, real practical. First team is your family, okay? If you're married or your spouse, uh, you got kids, I mean, that's your first team, all right? And you've got to make sure in that team that you're doing everything you can to take that team, those teammates, to Jesus, all right? So think about the people who live in your house. Think about the people who are in your family and say, how do I make sure this team is getting to Christ? And do everything you can to take people on that team to Jesus, we have things like Catalyst, we have things like Kids Rock to help you, okay? So if you're a parent and you got kids, we have those ministries because we wanna partner with you. Bottom line is, if your kid goes to Kids Rock, I think they'll have a great time, they'll have a phenomenal time, they'll learn God's word, they'll have adults in their life, but understand, probably at best, 60 hours the entire year is what they'll be in Kids Rock. But they're gonna be with you hour upon hour upon hour. So what we do in Kids Rock, what we do in Catalyst is supplemental to the way that you disciple your children at home, all right? But we want to partner with you. That's your first team. Uh, a couple other teams, though, that you could get on if you're not on a team. One is a small group team. 
A small group is a group of people that get together. They talk about God's word, they hang out, they pray together, they do life together. We have tons of small groups and tons of different kinds of small groups. We have high school small groups, we have middle school small groups, uh, we have home groups where, you know, uh, whether they're um, married couples together, whether it's, you know, a mix of singles and marrieds, we have all different kinds of home groups. We have men's groups, we have women's groups. Just tons of different kinds of groups. Two groups that will be starting up in the next couple weeks um, that might be specifically important to you. They might say, man, I want to try that group. Uh, one is a financial group. Uh, we call it uh, Financial Peace University. And uh, it's like a 10, 11 week small group, all right? So it's a short and small group. Um, but if you're like going, man, I need help budgeting. Like we make good money, but it seems like we're living paycheck to paycheck great small group for you. Or maybe you're in financial hardship and you're like, man, I, I got to figure out this, this money thing. Great small group. Maybe you're a young adult. You're kind of in your first career. Phenomenal small group for you. If you. The quicker you learn it, the better life will be when it comes to your finances. Uh, maybe you're at that point, you're just like, I just want to learn how to honor God better with my finances. Great small group for you. Um, so you can go to the Connect Corner and figure that out later if you want more information about that. The other uh, small group that's starting in September, besides a bunch of home groups, I have a bunch of home groups starting, but the other one that's kind of a specific one is what we call a marriage small group. We call it Love and Respect. And uh, it's about a six-week small group. And uh, what it's for is if you're just wanting to invest in your marriage, maybe you're having some marriage difficulties. You're like, hey, we need some help. Or maybe you're engaged and you're like, man, I'm going to be getting married this year. Phenomenal small group for you. So I um, really encourage you, maybe think about that. So there's all these different kinds of small groups that you can get on a team. Or the other one is a ministry team. So we have small group teams. We have service teams. The service teams are all kind. Everybody you see walking around serving, that's a team. And on those teams, you're doing mission together, but you also have a coach in your life who can lead you, who can help you, who can pray for you, who can, you know, give you some scriptures to think about throughout the week. So definitely encourage you to get on one of those teams. And, you know, we always want to help you get on one. So there's always room for you. But I know right now we have some areas that I would say needs. Like for instance, I know um, that there is uh, several needs in our, in our host ministry. Um, and the host ministry is the people who help pass uh, offering. They're the people who help you find seats. I know that they could use some more people um, to help with that. There's a, a need in our uh, parking ministry. We now have basically four different parking lots, if you haven't figured that out. And I appreciate many of you are parking at C3 and walking, all right? We will have a bridge eventually, okay? <laughs> Just give us time. Um, but, you know, we have that parking lot. We have the overflow parking lot. We have parking behind. And many of you all are going, yeah, we'll walk. We'll, we'll save some spots up front for other people. Um, but you've noticed we've got people who are helping park cars. We need more help in that area. We need help on our facilities team. 35,000 square feet needs to be cleaned every week. All right? We do that through a volunteer team. And, and there's some people you'd be like, man, I can do that. You know, that's a team that you could serve on. Um, we have needs uh, in our communion area. And communion is just helping put communion out each week. Very simple, but it's an area of need. And we always, always, always have need in Kids Rock, all right? You'll always hear me say that because we always have tons of kids coming. So there's a place for you to fit in to get on a team, and I want to encourage you to do that. But it's not just there. Let's keep moving on in the story. It started with a team of four guys, and then they said, let's do whatever it takes to get this guy to Jesus, Look back at the story again. These four guys, they pick up their friend. He's on a mat. They go to the house. When they get to the house, it's full. They can't get in the front door. They can't, they can't figure it out. Everybody's all around. So they, they do something that I'm guessing nobody else had done at that point. They said, well, let's just climb up on the roof. All right? Now, time out. Let's just admit it. I say roof weird. Okay? I also say naked weird if you are here last week. All right? So... Yeah, it's just who I am, but we're friends and we're okay with it. So I'll say roof sometimes, I'll say roof sometimes. It just, however it comes out, four guys go up on that thing that was on top of the house. <laughs> they carry their friend up there. They get him up there. They find the place that they feel like where Jesus is at. And they're like, I think he's about right here. Let's dig a hole. All right. Now, I don't think any of us would like somebody digging a hole in our house. I know if, if somebody started digging a hole right now on the ceiling of, uh, of the church, we'd be like, uh, this is not normal. Jesus is teaching. All of a sudden, dust starts coming down. 
Next thing you know, you hear a racket up there. Then all of a sudden, it starts to peel back and sunlight's coming through. Jesus is knowing what's going on because he's God. But you know everybody who's watching, hanging out, they're like, Jesus, you got to stop talking because something's going on above you. Next thing you know, they peel it open and four guys look through a hole in the roof. Picture it. Jesus like, what's up, fellas? Four guys, hey, we got the right spot. Four guys making fools of themselves. I mean, they had no clue what Jesus would do. They had no clue if, if he'd look at them and go, um, you're interrupting. You know, he could do whatever he wanted. Four guys head through the hole making fools of themselves. But they were able to do it because they were teamed up. And they said, we got to take our friend to Jesus. I mean, I remember July 23rd. Saturday night, eight o'clock. The reason I remember that day is because five days later, we were supposed to open this facility. And I was standing in here on a Saturday night. I just practiced my message for Sunday morning that would be happening at the high school. And I remember after I got done practicing my message going, I'm supposed to stand in front of a thousand people and tell them in five days, we're going to be in this building. Yet I was looking at this building going, ain't no way. The floors weren't done. The walls weren't done. The parking lot looked like a war had happened in it. And I'm going, there is no way I will look like a fool standing in front of them. I had people walking in going, you think we're going to be in here this day? I'm like, "Uh, I think. (laughs) And I was at a moment doubting my faith, not faith in God, just doubting, you know, I got to stand in front of them. Do I just say, hey, let's wait another week? But here was my problem. So many volunteers had busted their humps to get in here. So many volunteers had done everything they could to be a part of what was going on. 20-some people had said, I want to get baptized that that, that first Sunday, that first weekend. I knew there were people that were going to come and meet Jesus for the first time. I'm like, we can't pull the plug. We got to get through there. Yet at the same time, I don't think there's any way possible. So I call a friend, call one of our elders. I was like, dude, can, can you come hang out with me? You know, he's like, you all right? I'm like, I think so. <laughs> we come, we walk around. And I'm like, dude, look at everything needs to get done. And we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, you okay if I still stand in front of people tomorrow and say we're going to be in here Thursday? He goes, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I said, I'm going to look like a fool. I need you to look like a fool with me if we don't get in. He's like, I'm with you. I got your back. And the strength of numbers gave me the willingness to stand and say, we're going to do it. And, and, and through our conversations of saying, you know what, the only way we won't be in here is if the city says we're not allowed to be in here. But if the city gives us permission, we're meeting, all right? Because we're a mobile church. We'll figure it out. We'll do it. But what happened is I had strength with somebody teaming up with me. And he was willing to say, push through, don't give up. And here's the bottom line. There's going to be times we're going to be saying, man, I need to take somebody to Jesus. And you're going to think, they ain't getting it. And you're going to want to say, ah, throw up my hands. Push through. Don't give up. You have a coworker who's just going through some junk, making some bad decisions. And you're just like, man, this guy ain't never going to get it. Don't give up on him. Push through. You have a family member who just keeps falling right back into addiction. And every time they're like, I'm ready to get clean. I'm ready to do this. All of a sudden they keep falling back. Push through. Don't give up. Keep doing your very best to take them to Jesus. If it requires that you dig a hole and look like a fool, dig a hole and look like a fool. Because the best thing you can do is get that person to Jesus' feet. And they lowered this guy down on this mat. And he went down on this mat, and he's right in front of Jesus. And when he's right in front of Jesus, Jesus does this. It says this in the scripture. Let me read it for you again. I love this part of the story. It's in uh, verse 5. It says, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. I mean, think about this for a second. Jesus saw their faith. A man is laying in front of him at his feet, but Jesus is looking up and he's seeing their faith. And because of their faith, he moved in his life. 
So we've got to say, I'm not going to give up on that person who who keeps jumping into sin. I'm not going to give up on that family member. I'm not going to give up on my child. I'm not going to give up on my coworker. I'm not going to give up on my neighbor. I'm going to do everything I can to move in their lives. And maybe, maybe because of your faith, God will move, that God will stir the heart, that God will change a life because he has the power to. And the religious leader says, how dare you say that you can forgive sins? Only God in heaven can forgive sins. And Jesus knows their thoughts. And he says, I'm going to show you who I really am. You think that only God in heaven can forgive sins. Well, is it easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or is it easier for me to say, get up and walk? Now, now understand what he's saying when he says, get up and walk. You see, there's two things that, that a Jewish person during that time would have in their mind. One, they would say this, that the only person who can do miracles from God is a guy who is blessed by God. So if Jesus is saying, I am God, I can forgive sins, well, he's going to ask for a miracle and God's going to say, uh-uh, because you're blaspheming. You see what I'm saying? They're like, there's no way he'll be able to perform a miracle because he's doing something God wouldn't allow. But Jesus is saying, but you don't get it. I am God. So when I say that he can get up and walk, what I'm doing is proving to you that the Father and I are one and he's listening to me. But then he's also, to a Jewish person, they'd say, well, he's sick, he's lame, he's paralyzed, which means he has sin in his life. It isn't an illness that has him down, it's sin. So he can't walk because of sin. So if you say that his sins are forgiven and he gets up and walks, then his sins are forgiven. So Jesus is saying, I can say your sins are forgiven or I can just say get up and walk. Which one you want me to say? That's pretty much what he's saying. He's saying, for your benefit, how about this? Dude, pick up your mat, get up, jump for joy, go home. And the guy reaches down, feels his legs, stands up, picks up his mat, and he's gone. God forgives and God sets free. And I've been preaching a lot about we need to do everything we can to take our friends, our family members, whoever, to Jesus. And we got to team up to do that. But I also want to make sure we cover this. Some of you feel like you're laying on a mat. Some of you feel like, man, life's got me down. Some of you feel like that you're broken. You got a broken marriage and you're just like, man, I'm broken. I got a broken Life because of addiction, and you're broken. I got a broken job. I got a broken, just, and you feel like you're on a mat. I want you to hear this. It was this guy's brokenness that brought him to Jesus. And it's your brokenness that can bring you to Jesus. He laid on that mat in front of God, and God said, Jesus said, get up. And when he's saying get up, he's saying your sins are forgiven. You are set free. Your life will never be the same again. And for some of you this morning, that's it for you. You feel broken, but today's the day that your sins can be forgiven and that you can be set free and your life can be changed. If you've never placed faith in God, if you've never said, Jesus, I need you. That's what it means to put faith in God. Jesus, I need you. Man, today can be your day. You can say a simple prayer. You can just say, Jesus, I need you. I just need you in my life. And he can set you free. He can forgive you of your sins today. And I wanna invite you, if that's you, to say that prayer. But I also wanna encourage you, come to the Connect Corner. While we sing, we're going to sing in a second. While we sing, come to the Connect Corner. I'm going to be standing right there. You don't have to go outside. You can come straight to the back of the room where it says Connect. I'll be there. There will be some prayer counselors there. We would love to just to pray with you about this and to help you take that step towards Christ. For others of us, we need to remember this morning that it's it's my job to take people to Jesus. And you need to think about what, what does that mean? How do I do that? Maybe it means teaming up with some other people and serving on a ministry or getting on a small group. Maybe it means looking at your family team. However it is that God's moving in your heart, you figure that out. 
Maybe this morning while we respond, maybe you wanna take communion. There's communion up on the sides of the stage here and you can take that piece of bread or that cup of juice and you can remember Jesus' body and his blood that was poured out for you. Maybe today you're like, man, I, I need to get baptized. You know, whether you're wanting to do that right now, whether you're wanting to get that scheduled for next week or the following week, whatever. And any of those kind of decisions, if you need to talk to somebody about that, you just come to the Connect Corner. We're gonna be there. We'd love to talk to you. Would you do me a favor? Would you stand up with me? And uh, I'm gonna say a prayer. I invite you to just to pray with me. And then we're gonna go into time where we're gonna just sing a little bit, sing a couple songs and have a time to respond to the things we've discovered this morning. All right. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. God, I thank you for today. I thank you that you set people free. God, I pray for anyone who's here this morning that, that you would move on their behalf and convict their hearts and help them to make a change and to cry out to you, God. God, I pray for all of us that we would just simply respond to the things we've discovered today. Thank you for being our God, our Lord, our Savior, our King. In your son's name, amen. Church, let's respond.